Well, thanks again for joining us for today's NSBA conversation on priority issues uh, with the Leadership Council. My name is Molly Day here on staff at NSBA, and it is my pleasure to turn it over to our fearless leader, ML Mackey, who is the chair for NSBA this year, and she's going to do the formal uh, welcome. So, Malvina, if you want to go ahead and take that screen down, and before I quickly turn it over to ML, just a reminder for those of you who are joining us, uh, we will do four breakout sessions, so please don't forget to sign up for one of those. What you need to do is simply send me a private chat um, and let me know if you want the Economic Development, Environment and Regulatory, Health and Human Resources, or Taxation Committee, and I'll get you assigned to those breakout rooms. Thanks. ML, over to you. All right. Thank you so much. Do any of the rest of you have this weird feeling like when you sit in your house and you're working from home, sitting in your basement, like it's so fun seeing all your faces and knowing who's here that I'm not just talking to myself again. But if I get a little informal, please, please forgive me. It is, it is the approach from a basement office. So I, as Molly said, I really want to welcome you and thank you, all of you folks on the Leadership Council, for your input from the last two months. I'm going to outline a little bit about how today is going to go. I'm looking forward to it. This is sort of a new approach for us and, and I think going to be really quite valuable. We have 20 minutes that will be on the briefing. We'll have 10 minutes of Q&A for all of us together to talk about all the issues. Um, and then we will have breakout rooms for 20 minutes. So again, tell Molly where, where you want to be and what you, what you want to be talking about. And then we'll have five minutes where we come back together and do a final wrap up with the full group. I do want to let you know that we're going to be recording all the sessions, but we'll only be making that 20 minute briefing session public, not the breakout rooms. It's important that we have the ability to have open and candid conversations with each other. They will be recorded, but they're only for NSBA staff just to make sure that we're getting the content in the way we need to and, and to position what we need to advocate for. But the only thing that's going to be publicly released is, is this briefing session. So in the breakout rooms, what to expect? At the end of the Q&A, we'll split into four groups, as Molly said, based on our issue committees. We hope for an open dialogue with staff member in each room, with staff members and the issue committee chairs uh, in each room. We're gonna offer up a few questions for the group and what we wanna hear from you and, and enjoy this time to, to not only be able to contribute your, contribute your own thoughts, but hear from other small business owners. I often find it is uh, heartening to understand my experience replicated in other people's experience as well. It's a, it's a good and interesting group of people we have together for you today. Um, we want to hear ideas for moving our priorities forward, uh, very tactical, like what could we act on kinds of things, as well as any other issues, ideas for consideration. I think someone's mic is hot that maybe doesn't realize it, but any other issues for consideration. So we're testing our breakout room approach. We'd like to see how it works out. We want to understand how the discussion goes. And unfortunately today you can only be in one of the breakout rooms. We do plan to do this moving forward. Um, in the next 15 minutes, and really the sooner the better, <laughs> please chat directly to Molly or all the panelists with the group you wish to be in and she will assign you. I don't know if you know how to do, everybody knows how to do that individual, you know, reach just to Molly. The groups and the abbreviations you can use are Economic Development, ED, Environment and Regulatory Affairs, ERA, Health and Human Resources, HHR, and Taxation, Tax. So Economic Development, Environment and Regulatory Affairs, Health and Human Resources, and Taxation. Todd and I will be bouncing around to each of the rooms. Um, we also have some of the issue chairs with us and they will also be in the breakout rooms to get your input and answer questions. So I'm gonna, introduce you to the chairs that are in the meeting. Marilyn Wilson-Lund heads up our Economic Development Committee. Marilyn is the managing partner of Wave Group, a strategic consulting firm in real estate based in California. Marilyn is the leading researcher in the real estate industry today, brings a keen communications, positioning, and marketing skills to Wave Group and to NSBA. Bill Belknap is chair for our Environment and Regulatory Affairs Committee. He is the CEO and president of AEONRG LLC, a maintenance, repair, and operations services, MRO services to support veteran affairs and various other federal and state governments. Bob Shea runs our Health and Human Resources Committee. He's a partner at Beck Reed Ridden in Boston, where he specializes in labor and employment law. And Malcolm Prouty chairs our tax committee. He is the president and CEO of Systems and Materials Research Corporation, a small business specializing in R&D for the aerospace and defense sectors. So I will tell you, we have four great leaders that are gonna be in each of these rooms. Small business owners who contribute their time consistently and participate actively on the board and, and run these committee events. So you are going 
going to really enjoy your conversations with them. With that, I will turn it over. I think, Molly, I turn this now back to Todd, correct? That's correct. I, I think you do. And, and I want to add, add my welcome to everybody. I'm Todd McCracken. I'm the, the president of NSBA. For those of you I have not met in person, and I really appreciate uh, all of you being here, ML, for that great introduction. And uh, I want to also introduce uh, Jody Milanese, who's our uh, Vice President for Government Affairs here at the Association. And Jody and I are going to kind of walk through the various uh, 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 issues, the priority issues that um, uh, the Leadership Council and the membership voted on last month that rose to the top and just kind of give you a little briefing on where each of them seems to stand, what our sort of prognosis is for as we move forward in this year and next, for how those can move forward, where we're optimistic, pessimistic, what the obstacles are, what the sort of state of play for each of them is. Um, and then we're going to move to a uh, little uh, uh, Q&A and then we'll go into the breakout rooms that, uh, that uh, uh, ML and, and, and Molly have been telling you about. Uh, and again, if you did join us late, Text Molly Day privately. Which of the, which of the four uh, breakout rooms you would like to be, like to be in? Um, uh, so with that, um, I, I want to bring in uh, uh, Jody Milanese, um, and we'll talk about these issues. We you'll see on your screen a slide that shows we're going to have a star system for each of the issues. So if we think the the, the issue in, at hand is likely to see some attack, action or get addressed this year, we have it for three stars. If we think it's really possible, but not necessarily likely, we give it two stars. And if it's a little bit of a long shot, so that's the kind of thing we really need to work on and galvanize small business around and really uh, address at a more fundamental level, then it's a bit more of a long shot. So you'll, when you see these stars, it doesn't necessarily mean one issue is more or less important than another. It's just our, our subjective rating of, of their, you know, um, uh, legislative possibility or regulatory possibility in the relative near term. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think we'll move forward and we'll do go through the 11 issues. Um, and at the end, we will do a, do a Q&A. So hold your questions until then and use the, the, uh, uh, the, the Q&A slide, if you don't mind, to, uh, to uh, get those questions asked. Um, all right, Jody, let's start at the top. The very first issue uh, is bolstering SBA lending. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, I think it's remarkable that it's this high on the list. I think it tells me that um, a that the uh, PPP and other programs are still incredibly important for the small business community, but also small businesses as they think about growing uh, out of this uh, difficult economic time realize that that lending and access to capital are probably more important than they've ever been. So I think those are the things that drove it to the to the top of the list, um, and uh, 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 we. You know, have a few things that are that are happening piecemeal to help with this. One is specifically on the PPP program. We managed to get a bill passed in the House last week that extends the period for the for the for the uh, PPP program's existence, Paycheck Protection Program's existence, beyond March 31st, where it's set to expire again. Uh, that passed the House pretty comfortably, um, and we expect the Senate will take it up later this later this week. So that's an important piece of that. Um, and then uh, we also think there are real opportunities to broaden the other programs at the SBA and to make them more accessible and, and uh, uh, meaningful to the small business community. So we're going to be working with the House and Senate Small Business Committees this year to get that done. Uh, Jody, any other thoughts on that before we move on to the next issue? Yeah, I would just agree, um, especially the new SBA administrator, Guzman, who was just sworn in yesterday. Mm -hmm. She has already said, you know, priorities moving forward are going to be some of these other vehicles. The focus for the past year has been on PPP, but looking at more of their main, you know, Main Street lending programs like 7A and 504, um, really trying to build up the technology on those. Um, expanding the, um, just expanding the programs themselves, um, more transparency, just building off of what came out of PPP and, and focusing a little bit more on these other programs too, moving forward. Yeah, so. I should specifically also mention the IDLE program. I think that's gotten not as much attention as the Paycheck Protection Program has. 
Um, but I, we're, we're trying to galvanize some support now also to make that more user-friendly and, and a quicker process for, app, for the application and the, and the approval of those loans. Uh, and I think there's some real interest in that as well. I think we're really benefiting from the fact that small businesses are getting so much attention right now. And so I think there's an opportunity to address these things in a way that maybe we haven't had for a couple of years. So uh, okay. we are modestly optimistic about getting those addressed this year. So uh, in time, let's go on to small business contracting. Um, there's a lot of, uh, again, realization of how important small business is to the economy, but also to the federal government. And we, as you may see in the news this week, there's, there's going to be a big push for a uh, infrastructure bill. And it's my sense, and Jody, I'd like your, your view of this as well, that there's a real opportunity to get some attention in that bill toward, toward uh, improving small business access to not just the infrastructure contracts, but contracting overall and putting some real teeth in some of the rules we already have. I would agree. I think the Biden administration can certainly use this infrastructure spending package that they're developing now as a form of, you know, stimulus for small business contract. There's mm -hmm. certainly areas for improvement and, um, you know, they've already, the administration had already said that they want to focus on, um, you know, building out some of these underserved um, minority, uh, you know, communities um, where there is a gap between accessing capital, counseling, federal contracting opportunities. Um, so I think that's a place where we may see some, some work done through this infrastructure bill that they're putting together. Yep, I, I agree. I think that's, that's going to be some real attention for us. We already had some preliminary meetings with the administration, just so you know, uh, about this topic. And we've made it very clear to them that we, th our, in our view, this, that the key to small business support for an infrastructure package potentially is assurance that small business will actually get to participate in that, uh, in that infrastructure, in that construction. So, um, and, and I should also add that infrastructure bill is going to be a fairly broad base. It's not just about roads and bridges. It's about lots of other things too, including uh, 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 greater access for uh, uh, high-speed data for more for more uh, small companies and more underserved areas. Uh, next on our list is uh, improving access to credit, and this ties into the improved SBA lending, obviously. But there's a lot more to it than that, and and uh, uh, I think a lot of us are really concerned, and I think this came through from the membership that after the last year, a lot of small companies will have seen their, their reserves depleted. They will have seen their credit scores having taken a hit at exactly the moment when they'll need to be growing out of this recession. And the, the banks are gonna need some flexibility from regulators uh, more than we've seen in the last uh, 10 years or so to uh, be able to enable that lending. And so that's something that's gonna get our attention. The actionability score is relatively low. It's gonna be, this is gonna be a tough lift, folks. This is gonna be hard to get the, the, the attention of the bank regulatory community, largely because it, I don't think it will be driven by Congress. So it won't be subject to traditional political pressure. Uh, it's much more likely we're going to get to the OCC and the Federal Reserve and the, and the regulators at the Department of Treasury to get some of this stuff done. Uh, and, uh, and there may be some congressional rules that, that need changing as well. But this is one where I think people can really begin talking it up. And, and if you're in the economic development breakout after this, um, uh, we, we do intend to have some discussion about what kinds of changes, what are, what are the obstacles you really see in small business lending so that we can make sure we're tackling the right stuff. Um, let's go on to healthcare. And that's, that's all way, that's for years, that's been a high priority item. Uh, and of course, the, our, our priority is running in the cost of healthcare. Again, this is one we're relatively pessimistic about because most of the attention right now in healthcare is, is, has to do with how do we broaden access and other things. There's some attention to bringing down drug prices specifically, uh, but we're kind of pessimistic, right, Jody, about, the, about yeah. uh, the chances to really seriously bring down the cost of healthcare. So this falls into the, to the bucket of an issue that people really need to hear from us on to galvanize some of that action. So what else do you have on that, Jody? You no, know, I would agree. I, I don't think we're going to see necessarily a, a big overhaul package, but I think Congress may, you know, they're already talking about the prescription drug pricing, but surprise billing, um, addressing the growing uninsured population, whether we see some of these included in the infrastructure package and jobs package that they're putting together, perhaps. Um, 
maybe we'll have a little bit more attention to this once the Supreme Court makes their decision on the ACA. Um, that probably won't come out until late May, though. Mm -hmm. um, but a big overhaul, um, you know, healthcare package, I just don't necessarily see that happening. Um, but maybe yeah. some of these smaller, smaller pieces may get some attention. Um, possibly more so in the House. We've seen them pass legislation in the past, but I think it would be an, a little bit of a more uphill battle in the Senate. Yeah. And it's a really good point to point out the Supreme Court decision because it because the, there is a real possibility that significant portions of the ACA could get struck down this year. And if that does happen, then we then I think we would see some significant health care reform. Now, whether that reform would uh, lead us to lower health care costs is another question entirely, of course. But there's at least an opportunity in a vehicle if that were to happen that, to, to, for that to uh, be the case. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Tax reform. How do we do, do tax reform that prioritizes simplification? Uh, again, we, we're starting to be downers, folks, but that's this is one where we again have we're relatively pessimistic about the chances of actually getting this to happen and accomplished this year uh, because we don't really think the tax reform itself is going to be on the table this year. It could be, it probably will be, I should say, in the next two or three years because there's a whole raft of expiring tax provisions mm -hmm. they're going to have to address. And so uh, once there is a bigger tax bill, there could be some real opportunities to address simplification. But Jody, you just had a meeting with our tax uh, policy group just last week. So what, what were their thoughts on that? Yeah, I think our biggest concern is true looking forward to the expiration, especially of the, the, um, the Section 199A that will be coming up for expiration at the end of 2024. Um, those, um, you know, the, those pass-through businesses that have that tax preference right now. Um, something we've already heard um, may be being considered under this infrastructure bill if they if the Biden administration is putting together a four trillion dollar package, we may see some tax changes, um, including repeal of some of these parts. So this is something we're we're really feel very strongly about um, the section 199A working towards permanency for that. Um, so while it may seem far out 2024, it really isn't. And uh, this is a priority for us, um, you know, starting now and bringing attention to this and the need for it, getting us a little bit closer to parity, maybe not initially simplification, because I know that it, it is a complicated, um, uh, you know, rule, but uh, we, this is, a, this is something we're working on now. And the next, I think it's really telling that closing the partisan divide and reforming politics ranked so, so high on the priority list, given that it's not a specific small business issue. And I think the reason for that is, and this is my own color commentary a bit, is that, uh, uh, you know, we hear so much from politicians of all stripes about the importance of small business. And there really is a lot that politicians of all stripes agree on with about small business that never gets enacted, never gets addressed because it gets tied up in some other big partisan fight. And I think we're all kind of sick of it. Um, and that we, we really can, there really is a lot we could do and address uniquely for small business if we could find a way to get our, our our politicians to sort of ease up on the partisanship and begin to work together a little bit more. I think the small business community is, is almost unique in how much we could benefit from that because we're one of the few constituents that both sides of the aisle really do want to want to address. And there really is substantial issues on issues that we've already talked about, like access to credit. Access to credit is not a partisan issue. Um, and there's a lot there that could be addressed if only the politicians would be willing to come together, give the other side a little bit of credit, uh, not block everything that, that a particular party or, or, or officeholder is trying to do and work together and get it done. And so I think this is really reflective of that reality. Unfortunately, it's going to be a bit of a long haul to get that addressed, but I really just think it's important for, for, for nonpartisan uh, uh, constituents like the small business community to begin to step up and say, look, folks, this is, this has to be addressed. We can't go on this way. Uh, and we're really tired of the, of the partisanship. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I was fairly happy that it was so high on the priority list. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that, Jerry? No, I, I would agree. And I think as you often say too, a lot of, you know, there's pieces of legislation and packages that we see that really would benefit small businesses, but then they get 
boggled down by this partisanship and they never advance and they never move. And so it is, um, you know, detrimental to us because there's this infighting that's happening that is preventing some really good policy from going through. Yep. That's definitely the case. Uh, well, here's one we're a little bit more optimistic about because, again, this is an area where I think there is potential for part bipartisan agreement, and that's improving workforce training uh, and improving access to the overall workforce of the small business community. I think folks instinctively realize we're likely to see economic growth coming out of this soon, and we're going to be right back into the difficulties of finding a qualified workers where we were uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, so, and you, Trudy, yeah. what do you think? And I would just that? add, you, you know, you've already seen it. There's been already so many series of bills that have been introduced mm -hmm. um, to to address this. You know, to provide resources, to upgrade, you know, skills, pursue new careers. People are, you know, changing uh, career paths after the pandemic, and so also incentivizing businesses to hire and educate. Um, so I would agree. I think there is um, room for for something like this to 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 happen this year. Um, there's definitely a, 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 a desire on Capitol Hill to work to provide um, some, you know, some growth in, in programming for, you know, whether it's college education, um, right. specific skills, training for, for women or, um, you know, minorities in the labor force. So I, I would think we will see something. Yeah, I think we will too. The question I think would be how significant will it be? Will it be as comprehensive as it, as it needs to mm -hmm. be? Um, we'll take a little break here and just remind people that we're after we finish with this briefing, we're going to go into some breakout groups uh, on uh, taxation, economic development, environment and regulatory affairs, uh, and uh, health and human resources. And so uh, if you want to participate in one of those or you know which one you want to participate in, then privately chat Molly Day using the chat function to tell her which one you want to be in and that will get you there. Otherwise, you'll be randomly placed uh, in something um, uh, at, at the end of it. Uh, so let's go on to regulatory reform and paperwork reduction. Um, there's a lot of fear, I think, uh, of, of new regulations coming down the pike that could, that could be problematic for a lot of small companies. Um, we've been advocates for reforming the whole process for how regulations would get imposed in the first place um, and how we can reduce paperwork. But uh, Jody, why don't you tell us a little bit more about, about what's, in, what's likely there because you know, we're not terribly optimistic one more time. Yeah, so unfortunately, you know, regulatory burden just continues to to grow and it has grown for decades and we, we've seen this. Um, but there is, there is some possibility, maybe something would get included under suspension. You, you often see bills introduced bipartisanly, I should say, especially um, in, by House and Senate uh, small business committee members that really understand this issue, understand you know, that um, guidance and rulemaking have sort of really uh, important but separate roles at agencies across the government and sometimes law is merely a suggestion and it's not enforceable. Mm -hmm. um, and so working um, to really address these issues and things that we've always um, wanted and commented on are, um, you know, plain language simplification in, uh, in rulemaking notices, what it means to comply. Um, and we've already been seeing legislation introduced this year. Maybe something will happen under suspension um, or maybe some of these bills can, can be combined with some other pieces of legislation, but um, standalone bills, probably not the case advancing, but um, you know, there, there are a group of uh, members that really do understand what this means when you're trying to uh, <laughs> understand what, what, what is being imposed on you. And we've seen that even with the PPP and the loan forgiveness and how they really tried to streamline it and uh, simplify the forgiveness application for, uh, for those PPP recipients. Yeah. All right, the next issue, the number nine priority was strengthening uh, federal innovation programs. And here we are pretty optimistic, actually. The, uh, the main uh, program in the federal government is the Small Business Innovative Research Program, SBIR, uh, which specifically requires agencies to set aside a, a share of their, of their uh, research budgets for the small business community. It's been a terrific and innovative program that's helped the agencies, helped small business, and helped the economy overall because of all the innovation and 
and uh, truck drifts that it, that it creates. Anyway, the program is up for, for uh, um, reauthorization in 2022, uh, but we think we'll may see some real uh, movement on that in 2021. And uh, in fact, what we're hoping for, and I think there's a reasonable chance of, is to get the program strengthened and permanently reauthorized. We're gonna have to come back in five or 10 years, every five or 10 years, and get it extended one more time. Um, so that's going to be our goal, and, and, I, and we're cautiously optimistic that's, that's achievable. Um, next is, is the minimum wage increase, which has been a lot of talk after, during the election, since the elections, about how to uh, and whether to increase the minimum wage. Uh, we've been you know, wary of a, of, a, of a flat across the board, large increase in the minimum wage, especially right now uh, when, when so many small, small companies that uh, are, are, tend to be, do tend to be low wage industries are, are really struggling. Um, so we've really been advising policymakers to sort of not do this right now. Um, and that, it does seem unlikely at this point. There was, there was some initial plans by some to include it in the, in the recovery bill we just saw passed that, that did not happen. Uh, there aren't a lot of other vehicles likely and given the, the closeness of the Senate, it does seem like even if a minimum wage bill were to pass, it would be a compromise and a fairly different than the original proposal, don't you think, Jody? Uh, yeah, I would agree. I think this one is probably right now a long shot, especially um, as we're still, you know, working through and coming out of the pandemic and the economy is on a shaky, shaky ground. Um, maybe at some point, Senate Republicans would be willing to you know, cut a deal on terms, but I think it would look significantly different. Um, you've seen some some Republican senators come out and said, you know, maybe they would uh, support an increase of of maybe a nine dollar or a ten dollar an hour. Um, so maybe you know something like that, um, where they would they would find a little bit more of a common ground than mm -hmm. than supporting the increase at the fifteen dollars that was originally proposed. Yep, I think that's right. And then finally, and we, have, we usually do 10, but there was a near tie between 10 and 11. So we, just, we chose to include the 11th uh, uh, priority on the list, which is support a fair and simple capital gains tax. Um, there's been a lot of concern about, about uh, proposals to essentially move capital gains taxes to be in line with uh, uh, ordinary income taxes. Uh, from many in the small business community, make sure that's done correctly so that it doesn't impede investment and in, and in, in high growth companies, especially. But also, there's been proposals that that would essentially make many people pay their capital gains taxes on an annual basis, not when the gain is actually is realized, as as I think most people probably understand. Currently, you pay a capital gains tax when you sell an asset and you actually realize the gain. Um, but there have been proposals that would make you pay the tax based on estimated gains, even though you haven't realized them or sold the asset, which would be incredibly complicated and burdensome for the small business community, obviously. Um, where do you think that stands, Jody? The, this is a tough one. Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden has a proposal out there. He has long kind of been part of this uh, conversation. And, you know, I think we may see something uh, from Senate Finance um, maybe he may have some hearings on this, some further discussions. He's had some discussion drafts in the past, but nothing has ever formally become legislation. Um, but this year may be the year where we actually see something, you know, put down in a proposal in place. Um, regarding passage, though, I that may be a tough one. <laughs> that may be, yeah. uh, we may not necessarily see something, you know, advance to the floor. Right. Okay. Well, I think those are 11 issues. We, uh, I know that was a kind of a quick overview of where they all stand. I hope that was somewhat helpful to give, your, give some perspective on things you might want to go out and advocate on how to do it. Uh, again, you'll have access to these sheets that we, uh, that we uh, um, just uh, put out so that you can see the, both the issue papers that we have developed around these issues, but also the action alerts that we've developed in case you want to advocate specifically on one of those with your legislators. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, as so, I think we'll just sort of see if people have questions. Maybe, maybe, maybe put them in the in the chat function right now if you have a specific question you'd like us to address. And and while we await those, we only have a few minutes for those. We're going to breakouts, by the way. Um, we, I thought I would 
give people a reminder for how we develop policy uh, here. We have our, our issue committees, which, which we try to get feedback and, and education from. We have smaller board appointed policy groups that then actually sort of d delve in deep on these issues and make very specific and detailed recommendations to the board on what our, what our stances should be and on our stands on the issues. Those are overseen by a legislative action council, which is the, the leadership of the board of, of, of NSBA. And ultimately it's our all volunteer, all small business board of trustees, which, uh, which ultimately approves and oversees all of those stands and policies. Um, and, you know, of course, small business community is incredibly diverse with lots of, 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 of issues, lots of perspectives, lots of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of key interests in the economy. And so we have put into place a few years ago to uh, 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 what I'll call an issue filter to help guide us on those issues that we want to take issues, a stance on. Uh, and so they're, they're basically this, that is the, is the issue specific to small business? Uh, and do we have a specific, and or do we have a specific small business perspective that would add value to the issue for us to engage in it? Secondly, uh, does it impact a broad cross section of our membership? Uh, uh, or is it something that only affects a fairly narrow subgroup of the membership? Uh, do we think we can really have an impact? Is it an issue that, that we can, uh, by getting engaged on and addressing, that we, can we truly move the needle as an organization? And then finally, uh, you know, basically how to do that. Uh, is it something we need to take on board and take, and take a leadership role as an SBA? Or is it the kind of issue where there are other organizations and other coalitions that exist that we can sort of plug into and lend a small business voice to. And so those are the things our committees and the board used to begin to address what the issues are that we should be addressing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some questions that have popped in now. Uh, we'll uh, see, them. see if we can uh, take them in turn. One is there is, there is a, a question about, about voting rights and, and what we're doing. Uh, we actually have not addressed this issue. That, 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 that's one that we have to, take through our, the issue filters that we just addressed. Um, but clearly as we develop an agenda around of uh, making our politics more bipartisan, nonpartisan, um, uh, our, our election rules are a key piece of that, right? I mean, because the politicians are responding to voters and the way we have our elections structured. So mm -hmm. some piece of that could be part of some, some eventual position. Yeah, and I would just add, this is this is an area we've discussed in our ERA policy group, obviously with the recent passage mm -hmm. of the For the People Act, which um, does make these sweeping reforms to voter rights, um, you know, election security, independent redistricting, things like that. Um, but we haven't necessarily developed a full sort of position or policy around it, but uh, this is something where our policy group has been starting to discuss this and what that looks like, especially especially as we are trying to, you know, close the partisan divide. I would just add about this specific piece of legislation. Um, it did pass the House um, and it had, uh, you know, all the Republicans voting against it. Um, so the likelihood of seeing this advance in the Senate may, may not happen, but um, obviously this is a conversation that's been having. So right. something certainly we'll be looking um, into a little bit deeper. All right. Uh, and then Darren Lawrence asked, is Congress discussing changing the data? Small a business must have an open and operational to be eligible for PPP. It is an issue that's come up repeatedly, but I don't think that is likely to be changed anytime soon. I mean, the uh, uh, I think we're in pretty good shape getting the PPP extended a, a few more months from the March 31st expiration. And I don't think there'll be a new PPP. So I don't think that's going to be um, uh, uh, happening. The bottom line. <laughs> um, and then Natalie Hazen asks, how can, what can we do to help small businesses when they're trying to raise capital uh, stop from being rejected due to too many credit pools? That, and that's one of the issues that we just discussed. So how do we mm -hmm. change cr I mean, credit reporting uh, and credit scores mm -hmm. are a huge issue for the small business community because uh, a lot of lenders don't seem to fundamentally understand the small business community and, and, re and, and too often uh, folks see a, uh, 
things that will, would make for a negative credit score for an individual borrower aren't necessarily negatives when, from the perspective of a small business. So small businesses should always be looking for new new uh, avenues for capital and credit and lending, right? Um, but that winds up looking uh, uh, bad on their on their uh, um, on their credit scores. So unfortunately, we are a little bit behind in order to have time for discussion. I think we need to stop and, and move into our, into our breakouts uh, now. Looks like everybody's getting back into the room. So we'll um, give it just a minute. I think it's a kind of, tends to be a bit of a slow trickle. Hopefully everybody got assigned. And I wanna thank you all again for your patience. I know that sometimes the technology is, while it's really cool, um, it doesn't always work exactly the way we want it to. So I appreciate your patience and um, any hiccups that we may have um, encountered. So with that, it looks like most everybody is back in. Um, Todd, are you back in the main room yet? I am here, yes. Uh, uh, well, that, I, my sense is that was relatively brief. Uh, and so I think that when we do this next time, we'll want to allow a little bit more time for, for the breakouts. Um, but but nevertheless, for when I was, I was, and I thought there was some really good discussions, some really good points, uh, and a couple of them that I was able to participate in now. But just sort of wrap up, I, I'd love to give, so those of you who weren't in, you know, you're only in one breakout session, if our, if our chairs could just give a really brief wrap up of kind of the tone of the discussion uh, in, in your sessions. I'll start with Malcolm Prouty, who, who chairs tax. Yeah, sure. No, we had some really good discussions in tax. Um, a lot of discussion around capital gains taxes, uh, uh, particularly some comments made on uh, how business owners don't typically make a lot of money year to year. And their, their big payout uh, is the long-term goal of selling their business and, and trying to figure out how they're going to pay for those taxes when, when that, if, it, if this new capital gains tax goes into effect and, and how that's going to be calculated. Uh, a lot of discussion around uh, self-employment. Uh, and, and uh, fair and equal treatment of uh, people that are categorized as self-employed uh, versus uh, other uh, types of uh, small business. Um, you know, they're, they're almost doubly charged when it comes to income tax and the self-employment tax. Um, and then there's the, some of the tax write-offs just aren't there for, for the self-employed. So a lot of talk about that. Uh, some talk about uh, increases in uh, small business audits, uh, particularly those that uh, uh, make less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, and then, uh, I think, lastly, uh, some discussion around tax policy and what might get uh, pushed through, either through the bills like the infrastructure bill that's coming out, or through things like reconciliation um, and how they might use reconciliation to to push some tax policy. Uh, things through. So lots of good discussion and um, uh, looking forward to, to keeping that discussion going in our future yeah. meetings. All right. Uh, Bill Belknap, you chaired the Environment and Regulatory Affairs session. Any, any particular highlights very briefly? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, we talked about the regulatory reform and paperwork reduction and also the uh, political reform. And uh, in particular, um, the, the topic of uh, uh, opening up small business or in this case, uh, uh, the um, uh, the closure of some small businesses and the enormity of the impact and uh, in some cases uh, uh, some believe the overreach of the government in closing small businesses just incredibly frustrating uh, certainly it's not uh, it's not uh, um, uh, the same businesses in the same manners aren't closed across the, the country the same way um, let alone uh, some small business owners do not feel empowered um, uh, and are looking for NSBA to for some help in, in that area. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, then uh, let's see, Marilyn Wilson, Economic Development. Looks like you had a big group there. What was the? We did. We had a pretty like? spirited discussion, <laughs> to say the least. Um, we hit at some of the really important issues of a, a lot of frustration about people not being able to get financing at all, or if so, not at the levels that they needed it to be, right. um, especially with working with commercial banks um, that generally seem to be a little bit more um, success with smaller, smaller regional banks. But then we had a few folks that were from rural areas that said there's just no regional banks to even go to. Uh, so we talked briefly about a, a bill that is about to be proposed by Senator Thune that uh, would provide economic incentives for rural areas. So, um, and mentioned that we're NSBA, of course, is behind that. So that's great. Um, 
And yeah, it was, I think a lot of it is that, you know, how do we help banks understand and a lot of the, the ways that they're using for qualification, for example, one, one person was in the, the events business and they said, we don't like that sector, so we're not supporting right. you. Another one said, you don't own a commercial building, so we're not supporting you, which is really sad given that we just did research and found that about 12% of people actually want to return to work full time. So those commercial businesses, those commercial buildings are going to be less and less over time as people just decide that, hey, we've been doing this virtual thing, let's keep doing it, right? So that, that qualification isn't necessarily helping. So just lots of frustrations around yeah. the ability to get financing and um, some people saying that, that COVID actually exacerbated problems of lack of capital for minority owned businesses and smaller businesses that didn't have the depth of capital. You know, it's kind of like to get banking money you need did not, you not to need money. That's obviously not how it works. So anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and then finally, uh, Bob Shea and the Health and Human Resources. Um, what's the yeah, top line? Yeah. <laughs> we as well had a, had a lively discussion. We have three priority issues we discussed. Uh, the reigning in cost of health care, improving workforce training, and um, ad addressing minimum wage increases. And... Um, Healthcare, uh, surprisingly, <laughs> was just uh, was just really touched upon, uh, and um, the the sentiment was expressed that there's just too much burden being placed on employers, particularly small employers, in carrying the load for providing health insurance for Americans. Um, and we discuss a little bit the minimum wage, and there's a little bit of I think a divergence of view on on supporting a fifteen dollar minimum wage, uh, but also recognizing that, uh, you know, what's, what's might work for New York may not work for uh, Alabama in that regard. Uh, but our main dis our discussion for the most part, most of our 20 minutes was focused on workforce training and it's clearly a very, uh, a lot of impassioned views about, uh, the need to improve workforce training, uh, both, uh, basic education levels as well as, uh, skill levels, technical skills, and um, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, a topic that uh, people think there should be more government, more federal government uh, action to support in various ways. It's not a one size fits all in any way. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to improving workforce training, but uh, an issue that uh, the members of our breakout session uh, believe that uh, you know, the government should spend more time and, and support more. Um, and, uh, um, and I think an issue that, uh, that, that really is NSBA, NSBA should really get behind yeah. in its advocacy efforts. Yep. And, and, and we will. Um, so thank you all, and thank you all for your for your for your feedback and input. This, this is not be the last thing like this we do, uh, so there'll be more opportunities uh, to continue the dialogue. And I think I'd like to turn things back to our our 2021 chair, Emil Mackey, for some for her thoughts. Emil, are you still there? I still am, and I'm going to be brief because I know we're we're shooting past the meeting a little bit. But I do I want to emphasize something. Uh, what struck me across each of the committee chairs coming back is how consistent the experience is across geographies and across industries, that there really is a common small business set of issues and um, opportunities to make positive change. The other thing that struck me was, first it struck me with Malcolm and then it struck me with the other three that followed as well. And Malcolm, I think what stood for me, just in being brief, was when you spoke to capital gains tax in terms of the experience of the small business owner who maybe doesn't make a lot of money during the duration of running their business keeps all those jobs and people employed that we're always credited with but the thoughtfulness of the ability to effectively sell their business and that's why capital gains taxes are a problem personalizing the well-researched well-written up issues that we move forward with your own story is so important. Remember that all politics is local, all politics is personal. Remember to advocate with the, for these issues with as much of your own texture and your own reason why as possible. Not everyone understands the small business experience like those of us that live and breathe it every day. So that, that's my call to action for today's meeting. And I will stop now because we're already over time. Thank you all for coming. This was great. Don't forget to stay connected, stay engaged, and uh, we'll move this forward. Thank you all. We'll be in touch. <laughs> <laughs>